Professor of Ophthalmology at at Johns Hopkins University. She was fellowship director for a number of years and is currently chair of the ASRS Retina Fellowship Directors um, section. And she's truly the world's leader in sickle retinopathy, um, both in the management of the disease and then more recently in the imaging of it. And she'll share some of that with us. And she's also doing some really cool work on artificial intelligence and imaging the peripheral retina. And she's working with David Chu, who we just heard from on that project as well. Adrian, thank you very much for being here. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Shanir, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, can you see my um, initial slides? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Disclosure is non-relevant. So we know wide field imaging has become a staple of our retinal practice and diagnosis of disease, staging, screening, machine learning, management, including surgical planning, as we've heard um, very nicely summarized in the previous talks, and also to gauge patients' response to various treatment modalities. So what do we mean when we talk about wide field imaging? So let's go back and talk about what is standard imaging. This is the seven fields um, imaging created by you know, the ETDRS that show the basic posterior pole seven fields standard imaging. So a task force got together to try to discuss what are the definitions of ultra wide field imaging. So posterior pole is about a 50 degree field of view. Uh, mid periphery is considered wide field, 60 to 100 degree field of view. Far periphery is where we're talking um, the anterior edge of the vortex vein ampulla and to be and beyond the pars plana, about 110 to 220 as far as the field of view. And then there's of course pan retinal field of imaging. So I'll show an example of a case in which uh, ultra wide field imaging helped me quite a bit and a patient I saw in my clinic, 72 year old man with a 20 year history of insulin dependent diabetes here. And you can see from the fundus, you do see some blood hemorrhages. Um, the perfusion looks fairly reasonable to me um, uh, from this view. And so if we compare kind of the view of the posterior pole to what was evident when we looked at the um, wide field imaging here. So we get a lot more information. So you can see these areas, peripheral, possible neovascularization, significant areas of capillary non-perfusion out to the periphery. Um, he's pretty avascular in the periphery and, and, and lots of blood hemorrhages. Uh, the ultra wide field fluorescein angiogram was quite impressive compared to what I saw from my uh, fundus exam with indirect ophthalmoscopy. You can see there's extensive non-perfusion and uh, neovascularization here um, in this gentleman, and the posterior pole is relatively well perfused. So I used ultra wide field imaging to guide me because this led me to initiate treatment with um, panretinal photocoagulation. I did try to use the ultra wide field force angiogram as a guide, as I often will. And it's very, very helpful and it gauges response to treatment. And uh, I did feel putting them side to side, the pre-treatment on the left and the post-treatment on the right, there was a little bit less leakage after um, placement of panretinal photocoagulation. I try to use the F ultra wide field fluorescein as a guide. I laser areas of non-perfusion, although probably he can use additional laser as well. I can go back and fill that in. Um, but definitely can be used to illustrate response to treatment and decrease neovascularization. So we're getting imaging um, data more and more. Um, what's more and more important for prognosis and treatment from ultra wide field imaging. So the DRCR looked at this in protocol AA to determine if the extent and location of non perfusion on ultra wide field fluorescein angiogram is associated with worsening diabetic retinopathy step score or need for treatment. They looked at 508 eyes followed prospectively over a four year period of time with wide field imaging. And the DRCR found that eyes with greater overall NPI or non perfused index. Um, carries a higher risk of diabetic retinopathy step score progression, and this was statistically significant. So certainly, if their uh, non-perfusion was greater in the posterior pole as to the mid-periphery, their increase for um, worsening diabetic retinopathy was certainly greater. And the presence of these PPL, or primarily peripheral lesions, was associated also with deep disease worsening. So here's an example of one of the cases from, from the study. You can see um, and the eye on ultra wide field color uh, uh, floor, uh, fundus photography shows primarily peripheral lesions at baseline. And um, the uh, fluorescein angiogram does show high non perfusion. And this was the type of eye that progressed in the study to actually progressing to neovascular disease requiring treatment. 
So ultra-wide field imaging is also used for diagnoses and uh, documentation of disease processes across a variety of diseases. You can see here this beautiful evidence, uh, this beautiful um, example of multimodal imaging in which Karubi and colleagues documented a peripheral retinal tear with subretinal fluid. Additionally, sometimes in diseases we think of as primarily macular diseases, we can get additional information from the periphery that can help. This is a patient who had um, macular uh, RPE and retinal atrophy, and the ultra-wide field fundus autofluorescence actually helped highlight the pisciform flex outside the mid-periphery. So this was a patient who actually had Stargardt's disease, and the ultra-wide field um, fundus autofluorescence was critical in helping the diagnosis in this patient. This is an example um, from Chowdhury's paper showing how uh, ultra-wide field imaging can be used in a multimodal uh, fashion and montage to document things like peripheral nave vascularization. You can see this beautiful image of peripheral NV uh, with a cross-section through um, with the, um, the OCT here. This is an example of a patient that I had, and if I think this is a macular case, I can see pre-retinal membranes, macular pucker here, but my ultra wide field image is super helpful for me because this is a patient who has proliferative sickle cell retinopathy, not only with a, a macular pucker and uh, macular fibrosis, but extensive, extensive peripheral neovascularization and um, from CFAN neovascularization. So this is the type of image that helps me to think about how I'm gonna approach the case. This is a patient with uh, toxoplasma cord, retinocorditis that can show um, definite improvement of uh, the lesion in response to treatment. So ultra-wide field imaging is super helpful to us. We use this to be able to work with the computer science team at Johns Hopkins to be able to identify CFAN neovascularization in, in sickle cell. So you can see here ultra-wide field images of patients with fibrosed or autoinfarcted CFAN lesions on the left, and a heat map was created after training a neural network to be able to teach the computer how to identify what is suspicious for a CFAN? And you can see the heat map where it's red, the computer's kind of getting that there may be some um, hint of a CFAN there forming. Uh, again, we use this for screening for sickle retinopathy. You can see a CFAN neovascularization in the periphery there. And that was our uh, kind of our uh, poster child case in this study. This is a study in which we put an Optos primary uh, wide field camera in the hematology clinic. And this is a study coordinator and a medical student, non-trained photographers who took these images of patients. We brought the camera to them. We brought the camera to the patients in the hematology clinic to be able to try to gauge, could we get reasonable pictures enough to gauge in a mass fashion, was this actually sickle cell retinopathy with actionable uh, pathology. So we had mass graders ev uh, evaluate these pictures taken by non-professional photographers to grade whether or not CFAN neovascularization could be identified. So we got a mixed bag of these pictures. When people show you images, we often show you the best of the best, but I'm going to show you what we got. This is a, um, in, in the, our real world setting, this is one of the images we got that shows a black sunburst lesion. Um, no, proliferal, no proliferative sickle disease. That one's fine. You can see a bit of lash in the bottom. This one, a little bit of lash in the bottom. Um, it's an upper lash because the picture's inverted. But you can see there's dehemoglobinized vitreous hemorrhage, some treated um, CFAN neovascularization in the periphery. Hmm, now we're getting to quite a bit of eyelid covering our picture. So is this good enough to gauge sickle ret sickle proliferative sickle retinopathy? Probably not. And then this picture, it's dark, you've got quite a lot of lid artifacts, so this was probably not, it was gauged as not good enough to gauge or to, to determine sickle retinopathy or not. So we got a mixed bag of pictures. And this one, this is the eyelid for practically covering the entire image, although, you know, you can still make out the peripheral uh, fibro C fan in the, in the periphery. So we got all kinds of images from our untrained photographer. So we uh, thought about a study, um, how do we give the photographer feedback in which the, to tell that the ultra wide field image is good or good enough to detect sickle retinopathy. So we work again with the computer science team to create an automated objective mass method to assess the quality of our ultra wide field images to give labeling of artifact and specifics about artifact. What kind of artifacts are we getting? So again, a neural network was trained to create multi-label classification with six labels delineated, trained on a subset of um, 243 images of the Optos uh, ultra-wide field fundus imaging. 
And we gave, um, we had a ground truth, which was me. I just looked at images, all the images, and told the computer, was there artifact and what was it? Is there eyelash present? Is there lower lid obstructing? Is there upper eyelid obstructing? Is this image too dark? Is there dark artifact? Is the image not centered? And you can see our results here, um, when which we should with the distribution of the various artifacts there. So our model performed actually fairly well with reasonable sensitivity, specificity, and receiver operating characteristics were pretty, pretty consistent. Okay. So this is a confusion map that just basically shows our true negatives and true positives uh, that our algorithm is performing uh, pretty well. And especially when it comes to things that are pretty, um, pretty clear, such as is their eyelash present or is their eyelid present. Okay, so here's an example of a good case in which the computer algorithm agreed with me. We thought the image uh, had too much flash and other things. And this was uh, where we showed pretty good agreement. And this is a case where, you know, the computer and I didn't quite agree um, on exactly what type of artifacts there were that was present. So next steps is we're working to optimize this neural network to detect good versus poor images. We want to challenge the algorithm with external data sets, happy to work with. Uh, with David at David Zoo and I are, have some work hopefully we're going to do together. So once we train our algorithm, how good is it? Can we take it on the road and test external data sets? Um, other retinal diseases, other imaging platforms. This is just done with the Optos, but what about the other imaging platforms for wide field imaging? How does it stand up? So generally speaking, in conclusion, the automated algorithm shows promising performance. It's important to tell the photographer what's wrong, not even just our novice photographers. I'm sure we all have photography um, issues where, you know, you, you send a patient for photography and you want a specific pathology image and you get something that you didn't want. So the photographers need that feedback um, in real time. And this is only going to help the patients improve utility and cost efficiency in wide field imaging. Of course, wide field imaging does have its limitations. Artifacts, as we just spoke about, peripheral distortion, pseudo color, the expense. These cameras, especially the one like I just showed, are pretty uh, pretty expensive. So it's tough to be able to integrate it into resource uh, limited settings, but we're working to do so. And it acquires a certain degree of technical ex expertise in acquisition and still interpretation. It does not substitute for clinical exams. Some providers use this as kind of a way of um, kind of a, a, an area to, sub to, to almost sometimes substitute for a peripheral retina exam. I think it's a good supplement to a good peripheral exam, but cannot be a substitute. Future applications include maybe we need to revise our staging character, staging classifications for things like diabetic retinopathy, retinal vascular occlusion. We mentioned screening and AI. And I'm particularly intrigued by the relationship between the peripheral retina and the, and the central retina and diseases like ROP, fever, IP, diabetic retinopathy, and even sickle retinopathy. So I think wide field imaging is definitely going to add to our knowledge base there. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, particularly the um, the colleagues from the Johns Hopkins Malone Center for Engineering and the Hematology Department. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Adrian, for an awesome talk as always. So